Okay. Good morning, everyone. I am Luis Tomé, Director of Observare, Observatory of Foreign Relations of Autonomy University of Lisbon, and I'm moderating this special session. On behalf of the EPRS 2021 organization, I'd like to start by thanking everyone for attending this session. And of course, a special thanks to our guest speaker, Sander Fernandes, that I am now introducing. Sander Fernandes is an assistant professor and researcher at the Research Center of Political Science at the University of Minho, Portugal. She holds a PhD in political science, specializing in international relations from Sciences Po, Paris. Her research interests include the European studies, the post-Soviet space, the European Union's external action, the relationship between the European Union and Russia, foreign policy analysis, international security, and multilateralism. Professor Sandra Fernandes collaborated with the Portuguese Embassy to the Russian Federation during the Portuguese presidencies of the EU in 2007 and 2021 in Moscow. She has a wide range of published works, including the book chapter Inter-European Union Dynamics, the interplay of divergences and convergences, to the Rutledge Handbook of EU-Russia Relations, Structures, Actors, Issues, published this year. Sandra Fernandes brings us today a communication entitled Russia and Eurasia, when concept, multi-publications. After a talk, uh, we invite all participants to ask questions and or make comments, either through the Zoom chat or orally. Sandra, once again, Thank you very much. The stage is yours. Good morning, Luis, and good morning to everyone. And a special thank you uh, to YEPAS for the invitation this year. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to share discussion uh, in this uh, conference. I had the pleasure to be um, in the presential conference two years ago. It was a huge success, and I, I had very stimulating academic exchanges uh, during, um, during the conference. So congratulations to, to keep going on with the conference in an online format. And um, I know it has been a, a great success. So it's, uh, it's really a privilege to be here today. Um, as um, Louise mentioned, uh, my presentation will uh, focus on Russia. And I, I share the screen here of my PowerPoint presentation. So everyone uh, is able to see Luis. It's okay? Yeah, yeah. All that. Okay, okay. So um, uh, I cited the opportunity of the critical juncture of uh, the publication last July of the new uh, National Security Strategy of Russia. And uh, this new security strategy um, puts uh, very clearly a lot of developments that have been appearing in um, in Russian positioning in Eurasia. And um, what I propose today is, uh, uh, is an analysis, is a view to try to make sense of uh, the defensive and offensive orientations of uh, the Russian uh, Federation in the uh, current context, and also uh, to understand if uh, Russia is somehow isolating itself in a reformulation of its orientation at the Eurasian scale. Because Eurasia has been uh, framed as a kind of policy, as a policy orientation mainly from 2016 onwards. And in, in order to make sense of it, I will resource um, mainly to, um, to uh, explaining and um, explaining the, uh, the key dimensions and the key interconnections between four geopolitical theories or ideologies, if you prefer, that have emerged from the past, have been reformulated in the 2000s, and now, uh, in my point of view, are very important to uh, make sense of Russian um, orientations. And these four uh, geopolitical uh, trends are one is called Eurasianism, the, the second one is called Isolationism, the third one Marginalism, and the fourth one is the Westerners' approach. And that being said, the importance of geopolitics in Russia today 
is um, is not only because uh, they, um, they they make sense of Russian worldview and Russian sense of uh, threats and opportunities, but also because it helps us grasp how far, how deep the um, reframing or the Russian positioning in terms of being an Eurasian country, uh, um, how far this uh, positioning uh, goes and what does it mean in practice. And um, the first uh, observation, as I mentioned, that in fact, there is a renewed significance of the Eurasian vision and scale for Russia. And it, is, uh, it has been associated mainly to what is, has been called the turn to the East uh, since 2008, uh, which includes mainly China. But as I will try to explain, it's much more nuanced. It's, there is far more than just a turn to the East and a focus on China. The story is a bit more complicated, has more meaning than uh, it may appear at the first sight. Uh, before I go to the, four, uh, to the explanation of the key aspects of the four geopolitical uh, trends, uh, I would like to underline that the main outcome of this turn to the east of this renewed significance of the Eurasian scale is an estrangement from Europe. So Russia has been developing something that is historically rooted, but in a renewed manner. The idea that Russia is different, is exceptional. And it's based historically on stereotypes that we all know, we, everyone knows the, the famous um, sentence um, of Churchill when he said that Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And it feeds into stereotypes also fed by, the, uh, by Russia itself when uh, it's, it portrays itself as a political, social, and cultural entity that you cannot grasp with your mind. And here I quote a famous poet, Yuchev. So today, these historical misperceptions are revived and they are revived in the sense that externally and from the Western point of view, Russia is each time more seen as an aggressive and an unpredictable partner and maybe not a partner. So I think it's very important also in practical terms to, to, to try to, to get Russia right, as Trinin said in a very famous publication of his. So all these uh, uh, geopolitical ideologies or, or, or thinking, hmm, the four trends that I will approach in this, uh, in this speech today, really are to be understood in the 21st century. Russia in the 21st century is Putin's Russia that has asserted a new course. So in practical terms, yes, foreign policy is, has been reasserted and it is uh, very clear in Europe in the post-Soviet space. And the causes of this dramatic change, so this is to be compared to the 90s, to, to the Yeltsin period, the causes of this dramatic change um, are uh, linked to this Putin leadership. Okay, Russia has been a revisionist state and has shown clearly conservative offenses, offensiveness. But this is only part of the image because on the contrary, the official discourse and Putin's discourse, and it, it has been quite popular as well, it's uh, that Russia is simply reasserting justice in world politics, world politics that have been unfairly dominated by United States and European countries. So I think it's worth understanding the image on the Russian side. What is the thinking? Why do we have this formulation of the security strategies that is clearly defensive or, or oriented and also preparedness, readiness to be more offensive? This is my reading of the, of the strategy. So Putin's regime is clearly part of the explanation, but it's not the only part. Uh, it's not all uh, of the explanation. And my argument today is that Russian geopolitics are a key to understand Putin's Russia and its reorientations. And these school of thoughts have been very, have been very influential for key external positioning and political initiatives during uh, Putin's uh, rule. So there is this interplay of four, politic, of four geopolitical streams. And uh, on the first analysis, um, what I think can be said is that if we look at Eurasianism and isolationism, 
clearly they contribute to a rebuilding of Russian power in material dimensions, mm, uh, military dimension, economy, if we, and territory. If we look, uh, if we take on, on, under consideration the exceptionalist view and the westernizers, they have been contributing to a repositioning of uh, Russia more in terms of values. And in that regard, we can understand better um, the consequences of this thinking of these thinkers, and I will uh, quote some of them in a moment, on the contestation of the world order by Russia. So we have here geopolitical trends that help us understand better material uh, dimensions of a Russian projection of power and also more ideationalist or if you want normative uh, dimensions in the uh, contestation of the uh, world order. Uh, if I may, I just would like to mention that as I don't see any face, uh, it's a bit, uh, um, well, it's a bit dry to talk like this. So please uh, pardon any, uh, my, my, the rhythm. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I see your face now. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> um, so uh, why uh, this focus on geopolitics? I've, I've been explaining why uh, since I've started uh, speaking today, but uh, uh, I think that uh, what is important to, to keep in mind is that um, these, uh, these uh, thinkers and the way they have reformulated uh, the geopolitical trends that exist in, in, uh, in Russian geopolitics, the, the important thing here is that these thinkers their ideas have been adapted by the ruling elite. So this, I, I would like to bring today this, um, it's not a gap, but this evolution. So we cannot look only at the geopolitical thinkers. We need to see how Putin, the Putin's cycles have been adapting it. So what the practitioners here have a key role. We will see that some of the ideas have been imported, but not exactly as they have, as they have been thought by the uh, geopolitical thinkers. And when I, I say that there are four trends, they are really different in terms of the degree of conceptualization and elaboration. Some of them are much more structured than others. And we will see that as well uh, today. Uh, let's have a look at when they entered into, into foreign policy making in, uh, in Russia. Uh, when did they uh, appear as... Uh, um, as, uh, uh, as foreign policy orientations. Uh, let's start to say that uh, Putin uh, was a Westerner, um, maybe a bit at the beginning, but under Putin, the Westerners are totally discredited. So the, it still exists, this trend, but it's not followed by the elite now, and it is neither popular. Eurasianism has started as a very radical doctrine and has been integrated in foreign policy in a softer version. So the, the, um, the geopolitical um, view on Eurasianism by the thinkers is much more radical than uh, the version that has been incorporated in, in, um, in current Russian foreign policy. The exceptionalist view uh, uh, is, uh, is actually a, a trait, a fissure that is common to Eurasianism and isolationism. And they both convey a vision that cuts Russia from its insertion in Europe. So uh, the result is the same in, um, in, um, in several uh, geopolitical trends. So with a difference in isolationism, um, imperial projects for Russia are condemned. And we do, you don't find any uh, straightforward anti-Western strategy in the isolationist trend. And then in the marginal exceptionalism, uh, we also find common uh, fissures uh, like in Eurasianism and isolationism. And what is common is that European countries are seen as enemies of Russia and with a special focus on the United Kingdom and the United States. However, marginals, the marginal view is much more radical in its anti-Americanism. And this is where you can find uh, a lot of um, uh, conspiracy theories against Russia. So let's have a look first at the first trend that is, uh, can be uh, um, uh, labeled as Eurasianism. And it is clearly under this trend that Russia is uh, trying to rebuild power. 
It is linked to the notion that is well known on, of the near abroad mm, as a natural zone of influence and control for Russia. Uh, and um, it is uh, somehow nostalgic of the imperial past of the country. It has historical roots that I will not um, uh, recall today. Uh, uh, but it's interesting to, to, to recall that classically, Eurogenists see Russia as one of the world civilizations, mm, as an alternative to the Western civilization. You find a multipolar vision of, hist of, um, of history and the world and um, of Russia having a natural place for dominating um, um, the Eurasian landscape mm, over Asia and uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, it's interesting as well that uh, uh, there is a kind of uh, in investment in the young Eurasian people mm, uh, that can replace the Western counterparts in world governance. One very well known name that is really, um, really quoted in the, in, in the West is Dugin. Mm. Dugin has a, has, a quite, has a very radical vision on Eurasia. Um, and a kind of sort of more conflictual view uh, uh, of the application uh, of this concept. And he advocates for um, a special alliance um, for, uh, with Islamic countries, especially Iran. And there is clearly an anti-Atlantic strategy in his view. Um, and uh, the expansion of power on a territorial basis is quite present in this, uh, in, in this vision as well. It's pretty much based on resentment with a strategic goal. So Dugin is, is associated to uh, extreme Eurasianism. He has even founded the party uh, Eurasia mm -hmm. uh, as a third way that would be uh, neither capitalist nor uh, uh, social, uh, socialist. Um, but if you talk to uh, the Russian intellectuals and elites, um, uh, Dugin is not seen as being very influential in terms of, uh, of the idea of Eurasia in current uh, foreign policy. And uh, there is a kind of myth in the West about his influence. So that is why I, I mention him. And anyway, he is one of the ideologists of Eurasianism, but in an extreme version. Contrarily, uh, two persons that are currently uh, um, the Eurasianist position of, of Russia are Sergei Karaganov and Timofey Borlachev, who have created this, uh, who are building this idea of greater Eurasia as replacing the concept of greater Europe. So this is a moderate version that has been adopted by the government. It is pretty much focused on the post-Soviet countries and it's, it, is, it has come to replace what has been, has been seen as the failure of Russian-EU partnership, the Russian-European Union partnership. The concept has been first used in 2015, and um, it uh, clearly uh, for, um, encourages a comprehensive cooperation between the Eurasian Economic Union and the One Belt, One Road uh, Chinese um, project. And after the annexation or reintegration of Crimea since 2014, it has clearly been a central pillar of Russian foreign policy. Um, and the, what this moderate version uh, encompasses is that uh, there is a momentum for the significance of Eurasia mm, uh, uh, for Russia, and uh, it is an opportunity for Russia to uh, turn to the idea of Eurasia and to size its strategic interests in a more sensible manner. The second trend, a uh, big geopolitical uh, um, trend in Russia, it can be called isolationism. Mm -hmm. And as I said in, uh, in the first overview, uh, there is an exceptionalist view of, of itself, of Russia uh, in, in, this, um, in this geopolitical trend of school. This is also an old um, ID that is based on the famous Alexander III um, um, uh, sentence. He said that Russia has only two allies, its army and fleet. So uh, it has been shared by conservatives at all times. This is a very conservative uh, trend. And it's related to the very well-known uh, image of Russia as a besieged fortress surrounded by enemies and traitors. 
And in current affairs, um, this uh, trend re-entered um, um, Putin's policies after his famous 2007 speech at the Security Conference of Munich. One of the names uh, of the thinkers is the ph philosopher Vadim Tsimburski, associated, to, so he's one of the uh, builders of this iso isolationist uh, vision for Russia. And it's, he, he depicts Russia as an island that should focus on internal development, namely in its far eastern regions, meaning the borders uh, with the Pacific and, and China. So you find the idea of a Russia island of the Great Limitrov that include the Baltic states in, in Eastern Europe, and this uh, Great Limitrov cuts Russia from Europe. So. In this vision, what is interesting to note is that there is no, there are no imperial ambitions. They are considered wrong and harmful Russia, for Russia. Historically, when Russia pushed beyond its boundaries, it was not in the beneficial for, for, for Russia. And uh, in this vision, instead, instead of a synergy between Europe and Asia, influencers like Surkov, Mm -hmm. prefer to depict Russia as a lonely entity. Mm -hmm. So, and as a lonely entity, Russia should strive for cooperation, but preserve self-assertion. So this is really an inward look in geopolitical perspective, okay? Common to the next trend that I will present, you have this idea of Russia as a civilization of its own with a global mission. Okay, we will see differences, but there is this view is common to isolationism and marginalism. Uh, uh, people as Lukyanov, uh, Fyodor Lukyanov, Alexa Miller, Miller uh, are also uh, conveying this idea. Um, and what, uh, what is uh, advised in, uh, by these thinkers and that is that the Russian revised strategy should be neither pro nor anti-Western, so the West should remain a meaningful partner, both economically and politically, but they, sh they should not be a pro or anti-Western. Russia should be more inward looking, um, considering uh, its interests. Because again, it's based on a historical observation that uh, two tendencies of uh, totally embracing the West or confronting the West have been misleading for the country. Okay, so it is time for another posture concerning the West. Surkov, as I mentioned, uh, is one of the persons uh, that has been uh, uh, incorporating this um, uh, isolationist ideas into uh, uh, Putin's policies. And actually he has been an alleged mastermind of the Kremlin. He has written um, two, um, uh, two famous articles that I, I quote in, my, in this PowerPoint. And he conveys uh, ideas of Nikolai Berdyaev. Uh, so this is this idea, as I mentioned, that Russia is a combination of East and West. It is not completely Asian or European. Um, but Russia, because of this, is doomed to geopolitical solitude. Okay, so in this vision, we don't have the idea of rupture of trade, scientific and military cooperation, but still we have this idea of isolating Russia and not uh, engaging in full cooperation or full uh, rupture or confrontation. The third trend uh, uh, um, that I would like to, to present is uh, marginalism or marginalized exceptionalism. It's also rooted in uh, historical uh, uh, tendencies uh, and basically on the idea that the Russian civilization is exceptional. It's an old idea, as we all know, but the new narrative has really come to, um, to be uh, protracted by Putin's um, regime as a new narrative on conservative values. And it has been fully, fully integrated in the text of the new strategy that I mentioned in the beginning, the new text that has been published on the 2nd of July on the new, um, concerning the new um, national security strategy of the Russian Federation. And for the first time, this is when Putin talks about a moral crisis. There is a more moral crisis in world politics that is affecting Russia. And actually, um, this is the only geopolitical vision that is based on a normative assessment of, Putin, of Russia's role in the world. Uh, 
including a conservative interpretation of Christian values. This is probably the geopolitical trend uh, that is less, um, let's say, um, we, do you don't really find um, a clear uh, intellectual production, okay? This is rather expressed by authorities with the support of the Russian Orthodox Church. One of the names that can be um, um, mentioned is Tarikov. He makes some imprecise formulations of the Russian civilization, but still we have this idea of the Russian civilization with a global mission. And this is clearly based on a normative superiority of the civilization and on the, on the centrality of the state for the flourishing of this um, uh, civilization. Another name is Prokhorov, and they are actually very active influencers, namely in social media, and they are supporters of uh, Putin's regime. So uh, the moral crisis that Putin is refer referring and that we can find in official texts now is, uh, is based on the idea that Russia is the last bastion of conservatism in the international arena, and it must defend uh, traditional values worldwide. In practice, it has resulted in, in clear support of extreme right and ultra-nationalist parties and groups in Europe and overseas. But of course, only those who were aware for Russian and anti-European Union and anti-American. The, uh, the Orthodox Church um, has been supporting uh, the, this promotion of uh, conservative uh, ideas. We can find um, a Russian world theory also uh, formulated by Patriarch Cyril. Um, but um, it's not clear that, um, that the, the, the thinkers, the promoter of this vision have a Christian understanding of these uh, traditional values. It's really based on the exceptionalist uh, um, culture and civilization of Russia more a mix of socialism and traditional values. You don't really find a Christianist or Christian uh, uh, formulation of this in Starikov or Prokhanov, for instance. But they are clearly anti-Americanists and uh, they use conspiracy theories to, to formulate their views. So here you, you have a photography of Starikov and Prokhanov, uh, some mention to their, um, to their key uh, publications. Uh, with Prokhanov, you have um, the formulation of the Russian dream. It's, the Russian dream is, is an interesting e image because it really shows that it's a mystic, more a mystical idea. And actually the experts consider his, his writings more are geopolitical novels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will just uh, give you this image um, of the Russian dream. For uh, Prokhanov, the Russian dream resembles a temple on a hill meant to spread the light on Russian land and the world, okay? And this light signifies a strong and righteous kingdom of justice, love, and grace. And in that regard, Prokhanov tells, um, tells us that Putin was blessed to become a national leader and now his personality is inseparable from Russia's destiny. Okay, we find this messianic role of the Russian uh, uh, civilization and, uh, and of Putin's role in it. In practical terms, uh, the recommendation is that Russia must concentrate on three geographical zones, the Arctic, the Far East, and the, so, uh, the South and Mediterranean areas. Huh? And Russia will only be a mighty power if it ensure, ensures control over, over these uh, regions. Um, they are members, both Starikov and Prokhanov are members of the Eastbox Club, where these ideas are protracted. And so that you have a, an idea of the importance of these uh, persons, uh, Prokhanov is a member of the State Council on Public Television and the Vice Chair of the Public Council at the Ministry of Defense. And Starikov is a very popular blogger on YouTube and, um, and he has also uh, an active page on the Russian uh, Facebook contact team. So they are basically uh, non-official supporters of, uh, of the Putin's uh, regime. Ah, Sorry, I'm just trying here to... Okay. Then let's go to the, uh, to the fourth um, uh, geopolitical um, uh, school of thought. Uh, that really dominated the 90s 
So uh, that is why the title of this uh, of this uh, part uh, I, I wrote the rise and fall because really this is a story of rise and fall. Um, and this is a geopolitical view that is clearly opposite to uh, as compared to the, the other three visions that I just presented uh, very briefly. And why uh, this view is opposite to the previous one? Because they start from a very different assumption. They start from the assumption that Russia is a European country. Okay, but this vision was pushed further away by the exceptionalism that I'm, is present in the other geopolitical trends. And ex exceptionalism is, in my point of view, really the way to understand why we have today a conservative turn in Russian government. One of the prominent figures of the Westerners in the 90s was Kozirev, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs. We have here two photographs of him, a younger and now. And uh, his role, for instance, as a defending pro-Western orientation was really seen as treacherous and defeatist for Russia. For Russia. And we all know uh, how the 90s are seen um, uh, by the Russian population hmm, in terms of um, very bad results of, for economic development, democracy, free market, etc. So as I said, we, we can find uh, some uh, uh, Western uh, orientations by Putin in the late 90s. Hmm? But um, this is uh, this is gone now, and uh, one uh, and in the literature, many authors uh, um, agree that uh, Putin became disillusioned about Russian-Western relations, um, mainly uh, uh, with the fear for his personal power after the color revelations, and mainly the Arab Spring and the murder of uh, Gaddafi in Libya. So today, basically, the only remaining Westerners that still are Putin's colleagues are Alexei Kudrin and Anatoly Shubais. Okay, and uh, uh, also they remained. Uh, so there are we can find some um, Western orientations in these two persons, but they are really like exceptional. Um, and as I said, the main explaining finer, uh, factor for the fall of the Westerners is the conservative turn at the Russian official level. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really hard today to find and public please, intellectuals five, in five Russia minutes. who, who, Sandra, five who minutes are- to close, please. Okay, okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are very few um, uh, pub um, publicly mm, intellectuals who are openly pro-Western pro today. Exception is Vladislav Inozemtsev. He has um, created the European Dialogue Project in 2016, and he defends uh, that Russia has always been a European country. And despite a sig significant deterioration of Russian European relations after the annexation of Crimea, European leaders must continue their efforts to westernize Russia. And he sees a second chance for Russian European relations that. Um, uh, when Russians face the choice of isolation and inevitable alliance with China, they think he thinks that uh, uh, Russia will come to the choice of Europe instead of China in the sense oh, of the alliance with China. Man, those kids were so fucking yeah. bad, dude. Um, I'm honestly, man, is he fucking bad, dude? He's so bad. Man. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, it's out of my control. Okay, so uh, to wrap up, um, the Westerners today. Uh, uh, so there are very few, and Inno Zemsev is one of them, that says that Russia needs to find a grand strategy that would not be Great Europe or Great Eurasia, because for Great Europe, there is a lack of geopolitical will today in Russia, and for Great Eurasia, he thinks that there, are, there is no common identity that can build this common Eurasia, uh, uh, I, uh, this Greater Eurasia ID. And for him, uh, both strategies, both visions ignore the United States. So he advocates a turn to the East, but it would not mean to China that he distrusts. It would mean a focus on the Far East territories, meaning Siberia, okay? And um, so the authentic East of uh, Russia is not China, but the, the North of the American continent. 
And Russia must overcome the dilemma of the east-west the east -west divide and accept its northern identity. So the, the idea that Russia has a northern identity is really uh, coming in the geopolitical thinking of Russia. And to wrap up on the westernizer, let me uh, talk briefly about Andrei Korshnov. That is a recent Russian westernizer, westerner collaborating with the Kremlin. Okay. And he thinks that Russia, if Russia successfully implements its Eurasian integration projects, it can return to Europe, but with uh, the capacity to, uh, to negotiate with Europe in its own terms, with new conditions for negotiations, okay? Um, so there is uh, this idea that Russia can come back to Europe, but when Russia has uh, uh, strengthen its, its negotiable capacities and is able to advance its most preferred out outcomes. So concluding, the four geopolitical doctrines are differently developed and articulated. Com common to all is the reaction to the deterioration of relations with the West and a perceived change in the global order that disfavors the United States and its allies. There is a choice of rapprochement with China and other Asian counterparts. This uh, rapprochement with China and Asia is straightforwardly present in the Eurasianist vision. In the exceptionalist concept, there is a more balanced vision between Asia and the West, okay? All the geopolitical discourses question whether Rus Russia is European or a different entity and reflect about Russian isolation and the benefits and disadvantages of uh, this uh, isolation. The, the, uh, the proposals for a Northern identity are arising, both in isolationist and Western ideology, and clearly reflect a mistrust concerning China. I could not develop this part, but uh, this is present in the isolationist vision as well, this idea of a Northern identity. And uh, uh, to, to really conclude now, um, there, I would conclude on a very uh, important challenge for Russia that has been enduring over centuries, that is still present in the 21st century, and that is not solved. And I hope my presentation has uh, un contributed to underline this, that Russia is asserting a Russian specific path and mission away from Europe. Is it happening? Or uh, does Russia um, needs uh, and should rebalance relations uh, uh, with Europe? Thank you very much for your attention. Luis, the floor is Thank yours you. again. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks for this stimulating presentation. We now open the debate. All participants can intervene via Zoom chat or Viva Voce. And in this case, just raise your hands in the Zoom button. I ask everyone to please be concise and objective in your comments and questions to allow more participants to speak and to give our guests enough time to answer. We have approximately 20, 21 minutes to close this session. I already have a question from Andrew Leung. You have you raise your hand. Please, Andrew, make early your question. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me first? Yeah, perfect. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, my question is that um, it seems that uh, Putin uh, was rather um, shocked uh, and also, um, if I could even word, use the word traumatized uh, by the collapse of the former USSR, uh, because he was a truly believer, he's a true believer uh, in uh, Russia's uh, exceptionalism and Russian's greatness um, in the past. And that was um, informed also by the former Russian uh, empire, even the glory uh, times of the Romanovs, um, but also um, in the Russian influence, um, at the, uh, also started the Russian's ascendancy, started by uh, Peter the Great. Um, and the collapse of the former USSR, um, of course, at the um, hands of uh, the, the Americans, uh, could have in, uh, driven him um, or driven Russia. Uh, to a kind of anti-American uh, uh, stance. Uh, now, uh, with the Northern uh, kind of um, uh, theory you, you advanced, uh, you suggest that um, Russia could well be rebalancing. Is it just a possibility? Because it's still the Eastern direction uh, towards China, uh, not towards China, but towards the, 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 the East. Um, of course, that there is a, a, a degree of mistrust in China, um, you mentioned the um, Siberia, which is largely 
uninhabited in terms of the percentage of population. Uh, it was half of the Siberia was former Chinese territory under the Qing dynasty. It was seized from China uh, at the height of the Russian empire. So that's, uh, the, uh, and then the, uh, the recent uh, immigration of China's immigrants and China's businesses in Siberia suggests that um, the possibility uh, that China could it, in the future uh, uh, even use a kind of referendum uh, kind of strategy that apply to Crimea uh, if, if the Russian people sort of um, populated uh, the um, a sparse part of the uh, Siberia. So I think I, I agree with you, there's a great deal of mistrust, but on the other hand, um, the uh, collapse of the former users are, um, could have informed um, Putin and a lot of the thinkers uh, you mentioned. So my question to you is that how much is this kind of uh, nostalgia for the past greatness uh, of the Russian empire, um, at least uh, under Peter the Great, uh, if not um, the, the, uh, the, even the glory times of the Romanovs even, um, could have informed the, the reason, some of the recent thinking and f uh, philosophies and uh, exceptionalism. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Now we have Christian Blobberberger. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, I just like to get uh, the speaker's opinion about the extent or the limitation of China Russian appro uh, approachment. Because based on your presentation and on other academic research, emphasizing uh, Russia exceptionalism. So any uh, reapproachment with China could therefore be only limited in time and limited in the in the deepness. What is your opinion on that? Thank you. Sandra, I think we could join a third question. In this case from Carlos Martins, he's asking what uh, like to, he'd like to know how the new generations born under Putin govern think about the Novorussia, I think, or a kind of imperial project of Putin as well, would like to know about, if possible, the perception of new generations about the fit of democracy. Okay. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your very interesting uh, engagement. Um, a lot of points, <laughs> I will try to, to address um, uh, as much as I can. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for, for, for your comments, of which I tend to agree um, mostly with most of it. Um, what I try to, to, to argue and to demonstrate in this very short presentation is that um, even in the exceptionalist mindset that is present in different geopolitical thinking, schools of thought, let's say, you don't have the same consequences in terms of what is the consequence for the, uh, have, of having an exceptionalist view of Russia. A consequence can be expansion and uh, nostalgia of the empire and go for it, okay? And uh, another consequence is Russia uh, focusing on internal developments. And if Russia focuses on internal developments, it's really important to look at the Far East and on the border with, uh, with, uh, with China, because two key dimensions that are formulated in the new strategy security of Russia is territory that are not new, but now are, are phrased in a very contundent manner, is territorial integrity and demography. Okay, and territorial integrity and demography are really key dimensions that you perfectly raised in terms of um, the, uh, the lack of population on the Russian side and the difficulty to guarantee uh, integrity should China uh, want to have any kind of strategy like the one in Crimea, like a referendum, for instance. So this is, this is a very uh, important issue that probably will um, um, take me to Christian, and thank you very much, Christian, for, for, your, uh, for your comment on the Chinese-Russian rapprochement that is um, by nature limited in kind and deepness. I, I would totally agree with you that 
Um, and that is why you can find even uh, like a hope of the Westerners today that Russia will, will turn back to Europe because the rapprochement with China is not realistic. China is too big, too powerful. The, the differences of economic development, the, the, the population size, and also the interests somehow will, will, will collide. And if we, we, we look at a very specific case study, uh, which is uh, Central Asia, the Central Asian states, it's really clear what China is doing uh, and the, 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 the space for special relationships that Russia is losing with Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, with all with the five Central Asian countries. And at the moment, and you, you have, you, there's even literature on that, that uh, uh, the, this is the neighborhood, the common neighborhood between Russia and China, the Central Asian states. And uh, a lot of, um, of persons are already predicting that what happened in the common neighborhood between Russia and the European Union will happen uh, between Russia and, uh, and, and China, but, in, uh, but with the disadvantages for, for, for Russia. I, even culturally, if we look at the implementation of the Confucius um, Institutes and on the presence of the Chinese language and culture, what the soft mm, policies, soft diplomacy that China is doing is really consistent as compared to what uh, Russia is, uh, is uh, doing. And one of the case studies as well is all the, uh, the projects concerning electricity, for instance, of China in these countries and the money that is being invested. So I, I would tend to totally agree with the limitation in kind and deepness of the Russian uh, Chinese uh, rapprochement, which I said is already an argument for the Westerners to, um, to, to ask for Russia to reconsider uh, estrangement from Europe. Um, coming back to Andrew's comments um, um, about the nostalgia for the past and how important is it today to understand uh, Putin's uh, foreign policy. I would say I would answer this with a yes and no at the same time because um, I think that the nostalgia of the past, which we can phrase in terms of the use of history as an instrument to legitimate, uh, for instance, a reintegration of Crimea and other uh, policies of Russia in the post-Soviet states, but also the Eurasianist positioning of of Russia today. So history is clearly an instrument. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Russia phrases it in two main terms. In the narrative, Russian narrative talks about historical truth and historical memory. So the historical memory is part of the patriotism of Russia. It's even uh, the way to build um, civic education in Russia. But at the same time, historical truth helps to build the image of the external enemies. So the historical truth and the real role of Russia in world history is being undermined by external agents, okay? So it serves several purposes at the same time. So I, I, I'm not sure it's really about nostalgia today. I think it's much more instrumental uh, than nostalgia uh, today. Um, and finally, I think it was Ricardo's question, Luis, that's it. I'm sorry, I don't think I got the question. It, it's related to democracy, oh, right? Not in fact, there are two questions. The first part okay. is how the new generations born mm -hmm. under Putin govern think or see the Nova Russia and the imperial project uh, Putin. And the other one is uh, the perception of new generations on the setbacks of democracy in Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a huge question. And actually, I think that this is one of the blind spots today in terms of research and also um, policy-oriented uh, research. Because when we talk about the new generation, okay, what, do we, what from outside, what do we see? Uh, we see persons like Navalny, for instance, okay, trying to, to um, uh, to make some kind of opposition, really uh, talking to the young generations, to the digitalized young generation. But most of these persons or let's say, people criticizing the government and the lack of the restrictions of freedoms of thought, um, they are basically outside of Russia today. Okay. <clears throat> so when we talk about the new, new generation that is in Russia today, 
uh, it's, there's clearly um, uh, young people that would like to oppose and to, to see another kind of regime in Russia. But I, I don't think we have in, enough clear numbers and these people are really restricted in terms of uh, coming to the public place and making them heard. So uh, it's really difficult today to have a clear perception of, um, of the young generation in Russia. But of course, uh, we, we know about the people who can uh, who talk and who, who exile themselves to other countries to be able to continue um, their opposition to the regime. And clearly, the, uh, the perception is that there is a corrupt regime uh, that is not working towards the mo real modernization of the country. And, uh, uh, and actually, please have a look at the um, European Parliament a discussion on Russia a few days ago. The, it's it's written black and white, right? Black and white that uh, Russia is a kleptocracy today. So, in a kleptocracy, what what is the place for the young generation to to strive for for um, a merit based and an an open society? It's it's quite difficult. Uh, that would be my my uh, my first uh, reactions to the very interesting comments, Luis. Thank you. I see no other hands, so I have my own questions. We have about nine minutes to close the session. Yeah, I know your thinking, as you know, my own center, but I, I'd like to hear your comments on two issues. The first one is, what is Russia's real goal and strategy in, in Afghanistan? Support the Taliban mm -hmm. regime or maintain ties with the armed opposition against the Taliban? as it did mm -hmm. in the past with Northern Alliance. Favor the influence of Pakistan and China to stabilize, for instance, Afghanistan, which is delicate in its relations with India, or contain Pak China's influence to try to include Afghanistan in a Russian area of influence extended from Central Asia. And the second question is on Russian per perceptions on the new AUKUS agreement between US, UK, and Australia. While mm -hmm. the primary target of AUKUS is, of course, contain China, there are broader implications, including for transatlantic relations and Eurasia as a whole. That is, in a growing US-China competitive bipolarity, could Russia be interested in a true military alliance with China? Thank you. OK. Thank you very much uh, for your very challenging questions. <laughs> Um, that actually go to a very pertinent geography that is uh, uh, the one of your specialization and where probably the world power is really moving to and, uh, and the a, new, a, very, a real new center of international politics. I will start with the second one. The US-UK-Australian deal. Uh, uh, actually, I've been accompanying much more from the French side. I, as you know, I'm also a French national, so I've been, I've been looking at it a lot from a French perspective. But um, um, I would say that, yes, I would agree that it really shows first uh, the importance of the Pacific uh, for many actors and not the least, of course, uh, the USA. And uh, also, uh, I think it shows first, I would say, uh, in my point of view, that really shows first uh, how, how far away has been placed Europe in uh, the US uh, vision of how to fulfill its strategic goals, okay? Uh, it's minoring um, France mm, uh, over Australia and, uh, and with the help of, um, of the United Kingdom is really a sign that I think is not merely symbolic. It's, 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 it really means something. Um, and yes, the, the growing uh, um, identification of China as a threat globally, but specifically in the uh, Indo-Pacific area, uh, I think is really something that has um, been in the mindset of the Americans when they, they, they took the deal with Australia and the UK. So I would tend to, I don't know if it's competitive bipolarity, but this move, I think can clearly be interpreted in this, in this um, American vision. Uh, if, uh, um, if Russia is, willing to engage in a true military alliance with China, right? This was your question, okay? Um, I would not think so because 
for that, you would need a much clearer and uh, real alignment of interests. And I don't see any of this in the Chinese-Russian relationship at the moment. And as you mentioned, India, China and India as the two big states that Russia looks at, particularly in the Asian, uh, um, when, when we say turn to the east for Russia, there is China, but there is also India. And as you know, uh, India is the first uh, uh, consumer of um, Russian exports in terms of uh, military uh, uh, um, goods. So it's a very important partner for, for Russia as well. So there are a lot of states, a lot of interest here. And uh, I'm not sure that um, it would help to make Russia support Pakistan, China to stabilize Afghanistan. Um, if uh, there is an opportunity, if there is a real goal from Russia and Afghanistan, there is always a goal for Russia and Afghanistan because of geography and history. But I would say that at the moment, and as it has been the case with all major crises, okay, in this big arch, let's say, of terrorism, uh, this uh, from uh, Indonesia to the to the Middle East, or the idea of the Greater Middle East of recalling this um, expression of a um, former American president Bush, I think Russia is still an opportunistic uh, country, more than a country that has a clear strategy and goal. So I think it will have to do more on being able, to, and Russia is really good at it, hmm, on being an opportunistic country, using diplomacy, but also material uh, means when it will be an opportunity for, for Russia. Uh, and honestly, I think that Russia is still struggling for having the means of its strategic goals. Very ambitious, but the means are still not there, I think, uh, in a full scale to fulfill these ambitions. That would be my, uh, my answer to your challenge, because your questions are really challenging. <laughs> there are no easy questions. Thank you, Sandra. We have two more minutes before we close the session. I'm asking if there is other comments or questions to our guest speaker. Once there is not, so it is time to close this special session. So it's not also to delay the course of the conference proceedings. And mm -hmm. once again, many thanks to our guest speaker, Sandra Fernandes. It was great to see you online and hear you and to everyone who participated in this session. We will now take a break, uh, turn off the Zoom session and turn it back again in about 15 minutes, 17 minutes for panel M09 in this same Zoom session. Hope to see you in a couple of minutes. Thank you all in particular, Sandra. <laughs>